Today's meeting celebrates Australian Anglicans' worship, performing APBA, Charles Sherlock's recently published commentary on A Prayer Book for Australia. This is a highly anticipated book and it complements his earlier publication, Performing the Gospel. Uh, Charles was a member of the liturgical commission that prepared A Prayer Book for Australia and has been teaching and reflecting on theology and liturgy for five decades. He has a dozen books to his name and has held positions on the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission and the two leading bodies in Australian theological education, the University of Divinity and the Australian College of Theology. We're joined today for a panel discussion with Charles and two speakers who are joining us from overseas, Brian Spinks and Jenny Dawson. Brian Spinks is Bishop F. Percy Goddard, Professor of Liturgical Studies and Pastoral Theology at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and Yale Divinity School. Uh, when I was preparing for this meeting, I took a look at my bookshelves and discovered that uh, Brian has written an eclectic amount across the range of liturgical studies. Um, and it was interesting to, to look at the books that I've, I've engaged with and, and to see just how formative some of his writing has been on my, my own thinking. Um, and his, his writing covers a breadth of topics, including histories of Anglican rites, such as the Book of Common Prayer, the Eucharist, and the theology and practice of baptism. And Brian is joining us in real time from the east coast of the USA, where it is Tuesday evening right now. Our other panel member is Jenny Dawson. Jenny is a priest of the Anglican Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia. She's ex she has exercised an extensive ministry in parishes and also as an archdeacon and regional dean. Jenny was a member of the Provincial Prayer Book Revision Commission that produced a New Zealand prayer book, He Karakia Mini Mihinare o Aotearoa. Her publications include a Radical Theology of Baptism, a critical investigation of the significance of baptism as a key element in the ecclesiology of the Anglican Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia, which came out in 2011. Today's conversation will unfold through discussion between our panel members, and then there will be open time for members more, people more broadly participating in the meeting to contribute questions, reflections and comments. I'd like to direct our first, um, our first question, first to Jenny and then to Brian and then Charles to reflect back. Um, and this is, a, a, this is taking up the title of the book, Australian Anglicans Worship Performing APBA. And the title clearly indicates that this is a prayer book of Australian origin and while certainly Anglican in its heritage, it reflects wider Anglican and ecumenical influences. Charles has sought to articulate these factors in this commentary on APBA and Jenny and Brian, as scholars from beyond Australian shores, what do you see as distinctive both in APBA and in this book. Kiorotato, which is the language of the local people where I live here, I'm asking myself at odd times why I bought this book, and I know very well why I did. Charles is a good friend who supervised my thesis for my Doctorate of Ministry Studies, and I knew it would be good because I've read his earlier book, some of his earlier books. But I found it's much more relevant to our situation than I thought. I bought a copy and gave it to my mother-in-law, who's worshipped in Sydney a couple of times, but she lives in this country, and she's finding it very helpful too. So it's led me to ask the question, exactly as Karen has asked, what is distinctively Australian about both 
APBA and this book as both obviously APBA contributes to the wealth of liturgical material around the Anglican communion, but also Ang Australian Anglicans worship makes a contribution beyond the shores of Australia. And it's, some of it's very obvious. The Christian Year Down Under in chapter four of Charles's book tackles the question quite directly. And there are so many prayers that are, he refers to and that I've grown to love in APBA that are unique, well, not unique, but particular to Australia, but have other, other echoes. So the prayers of reconciliation and confession, the prayers about drought, flood, bushfire, those are very Australian. And I have to note, note the seafarers prayer because my son works for the mission to seafarers in Melbourne. And we don't have a seafarers prayer in a, a New Zealand prayer book. But I'm also very interested in some of the specifically Australian references in the thanks and Thanksgiving three in the language, even in Psalm 65, I thought there's, there's words there that would not be used outside Australia. And there were something Charles referred to about echoing a new dawn. I didn't pick up because I'm not in Australia, but it's something that means a lot to those in Australia. So I think it's quite, con both books are quite consciously grounded in Australia, but with greater value, obviously. I loved Charles's coherent diversity term, and I think that is something that does not apply to the church in this country. My friend and liturgist Bosco Peters has written recently in an essay in the book edited by Robert and Stephen Burns. He talks about audacious liturgical practice in New Zealand. We don't have the coherence that is able to be celebrated and I hope is true on the ground in Australia, but it's a very useful term. The calendar is obviously particular to Australia in many places, and it's wonderful to get to know some of those, the people who are honored and remembered there. I think very quickly, uh, my story about why I came to this book is so um, with such enthusiasm to Charles's book was to learn about Cranmer which seems very strange when I've been on our liturgical uh, prayer book revision commission. But I came to faith as an adult who had experienced Sunday school and family services, came to faith with our first experimental services in this country. And so I was formed by them. When I was ordained in 1989, I actually had to learn from cue cards how to preside eastward facing in a congregation who knew all you who truly and earnestly repent, and all those words from 1928, far better than I did. So I have soaked up the Cranmerian material in Charles's book through the eyes of contemporary Ang Australian worship, because it's actually my, my kind of worship. I wasn't formed, as some of you have been, deeply by Cranmer. And, and that's been very, very special for me as I've, as I've learned more about the roots of our own liturgical tradition. BCP is not my story, but I'm certainly, I notice of course that Cranmer has the most references in the index, second, uh, and second is Gilbert Sindon, uh, quite appropriately. Part of the joy for me of being on our prayer book revision commission was getting to know the international people and their work. So Gilbert was one of them, Daniel Stevick and lots and lots of others whose work I discovered through that time of service. But I do see it as a, see both books as distinctively Australian while making a wider contribution. I'll be really interested to hear, you know, to hear the discussion and particularly hear, to hear what Brian thinks from his Episcopalian perspective in the States. Thank you. The first thing is, um, I can't speak from an Episcopalian um, perspective. Um, although I've been in the USA for 24 years and I do serve uh, in Episcopal parishes, I've never transferred from the Church of England and I'm still trying to understand the Episcopal Church. 
Um, uh, the Church of England is weird, but there's weird and even more weird. So uh, I can't give you that perspective. Um, I, I want to first of all congratulate Charles on on his um, his book. Um, it's extremely difficult, uh, I think, for anyone to write a sustained commentary all the way through uh, the different services of a prayer book. Um, and he, he's done it very well. So uh, I, I want to congratulate him on that. Um, I think that uh, what he also presents, and uh, which I think is a strength, is not only um, some of the history of Anglican um, liturgy, uh, but also reveal some of the things that went on in the debates and the commission. And this is extremely important, um, I think, because it's only then can people get a better understanding of um, the, the labor, the work, the angst, um, the quarreling that went on in commissions uh, and, and meetings to get an agreed text. Um, I'm just thinking of a Roman Catholic uh, commentator. Um, he, he used to be Anglican. He trained with me at St. Chad's College, Durham, but he uh, became a Roman Catholic monk. And he has commented on the uh, Church of England baptismal liturgies and um, in common worship. And uh, you know, I was able to look at his no, no, no. Published that, that's articles and that's and uh, realized that he'd read things into it that weren't there and missed things because he was not in on the inner debates and so I think what Charles is, uh, brings to this is the, some of the inner workings and thinking to understand the text. Um, I think also uh, that he uh, that the book is extremely useful in uh, that it shows how you can both inform and teach. Uh, one of the depressing things, um, it's uh, so certainly in the Church of England, but um, it's, it's certainly true in the Episcopal Church, but probably elsewhere, how, uh, how much many, how many clergy are totally inept and illiterate when it comes to liturgy. Uh, their only real interest in it is uh, what Father so-and-so or Pastor so-and-so taught them. Uh, this is the way to do it. And, um, and unless it fills the church, well, something else needs to be done. Uh, I think what Charles is presenting is uh, the idea that you can uh, deepen the service, that it isn't simply missionary, uh, that it is also devotional. Um, that worship is both an, or is an experience, an encounter, and an epiphany. And uh, so I think that's very important in this book. And I think that other uh, commentators on prayer books, if there are ever going to be more prayer books in the future, um, uh, this is a, a, a good lesson to learn. I suppose what I was looking for and missed, and this says more about my uh, ignorance, uh, and illiteracy of Australian culture was um, looking for more about enculturation and perhaps uh, looking for First Nation um, expressions. Um, at the end of the day, I, I felt this was very much um, uh, a, a, a white, white Anglicans uh, at, at, at work. And that may be the makeup of the church. I mean, you know, I, I could characterize the, the Episcopal Church here as um, uh, made up of very um, people who um, tend to be wealthy, certainly not necessarily in the congregations I serve, but uh, those in, in, power, in, in power, if you like, not bishops, but in lay power are wealthy people, well-connected and um, uh, politically co uh, connected too. And uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, uh, has more sway than uh, it should for the numbers who actually belong to the Episcopal Church, this holdover. So I'm wondering if there is something that, and I'm sure you'll be able to put me right on that. Um, I think I want to leave it there for the moment.
Uh, Charles, you will need to unmute. Sorry. Um, th thank you very much, Jenny and Brian. You're very kind. Just to start with Brian's last point, um, in the introduction, I say a major concern of the Commission was recognising the heritage and experience of Indigenous Australians. And there are quite a few contributions from them in the book, but to compared to where the nation is now, APBA is 25, it's a generation old. Um, and um, in fact, only yesterday, the University of Divinity launched the Centre for Indigenous Studies, which is the first um, tertiary level institute, which is actually um, staffed by Indigenous Australians. Um, the commission, um, I visited Noongalinga in Northern Territory a couple of times, but the liturgical life of Indigenous Anglicans, which are throughout um, Northern Territory and Queensland especially, it's utterly different, but that may be a topic for later on. My main response would be to say though, I, this is not an Aussie book. It's not intended to be hugely Australian. Um, and although Cranmer gets a lot of time because I grew up on Cranmer, Jenny, and I think it, it, I've tried to pay attention, take seriously the biblical and patristic and scholastic traditions. So when we come to baptism, you know, trying to discuss the importance of taking ex opera apparato and ex opera, understanding what they're about, I think matters. So it's not trying to be just Australian, it's not trying to be just Tranmerian, but to help Australian Anglicans understand today's context, what it means to perform the gospel as God's people, drawing on the whole Christian tradition. And for that, I am very grateful for the years I had on Archic and what I learnt from Roman Catholic people, not just in terms of theology, but the whole experience of living together each year for nine or 10 days, you know, in prayer. Um, anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you, Charles. Um, we're going to have a couple of questions focusing on baptism and then after that a couple of questions focusing on Eucharist. Um, this time we'll go Brian, Jenny, then Charles. And so addressing baptism, um, the first question is, what did you find in Charles's commentary where he, where he approaches baptism to be fresh and new or critical or challenging? So Brian first. Yeah, right. Um, I think uh, what Charles says about the uh, service of baptism uh, illustrates what I said generally about his approach, that uh, he uh, gives some history of, of, of the uh, baptismal rite, um, how uh, the more immediate of history of uh, uh, how it was formulated for this book and uh, its pastoral implications. And I think that's always helpful uh, for clergy. Um, I suppose it left me with these, these questions, um, uh, which is not specifically about the Australian book. It's, uh, I think, for uh, uh, many uh, churches beyond uh, uh, Anglicans. Um, and that is, uh, Anglicans seem to have put all their uh, money in the one baptismal basket. And I don't know if this um, has a, a, a parallel in uh, Australia, but in the Church of England, uh, particularly evangelical parishes, but not only them, um, would delay baptism. And if the, uh, the, the um, priest was not satisfied that there was sufficient commitment, uh, he or perhaps now she um, 
uh, would offer uh, a thanksgiving for the birth of a child instead. Um, there's been a, a very recent book, which I think is, is very good, um, uh, which I don't know if any of you have come across it. It's called A Right on the Edge by Sarah Lawrence. Its context is specifically England, but I think it applies beyond that. And she takes uh, to task having done lots of surveys and uh, looking at sociology, as well as uh, the theology of baptism. Uh, the idea that uh, um, uh, we should, clergy should turn down people whose religion seems folk religion. Um, we should take their desire seriously, even if it is well below what we think it should be. Um, and that together led me to think that perhaps we would do better as Anglicans thinking more of staged rites. And that is that everybody gets a welcome and thanksgiving for the birth of a child. That's where we start, regardless of your commitment. Uh, that those who uh, families that wish to go on uh, can then go through having been welcomed into the church and become at least we hope familiar, would then continue coming in terms for instruction to the rite of baptism and then use the renewal of vows or whatever we want to call them, promises, um, as an annual thing, not necessarily at Easter. Um, you know, we all know that the church can correct it will be Holy Saturday night and that's probably not going to happen with families with young children. But to have a particular Sunday at some stage uh, of the year, when we invite those back for the renewal of vows with the congregation. So that it's through a, a series of stages rather than all the eggs in one basket of baptism, it's that or nothing, or Thanksgiving as an alternative. And the other thing that struck me, um, one of the things that uh, I, I thought that the Church of England for once did get right uh, in common worship was to have different blessings over the water for different seasons of the year, uh, given that it's difficult to put all the themes of baptism into one prayer. It just becomes overwhelming, even for clergy, uh, let alone um, for, for families who perhaps do not have the depth of biblical uh, um, uh, knowledge. And so, you know, you have one for the season of Epiphany, which stresses the baptism of Christ. You have a different one for Easter, so Epiphany, but, uh, uh, baptism and rebirth, uh, Easter, um, uh, uh, resurrection, Pentecost, gifts of the Spirit, and then perhaps um, uh, another one for all saints or something. It just struck me that this too might be a way forward. Um, so uh, what, what, these, these are the questions that, I, that, that, that struck me as I, I read through this. But um, again, I want to, to thank Charles for, for what he's done on this and, and um, for, for clergy, particularly newly ordained clergy, I do believe this is a really lovely way of preparing them for uh, what the service is about and what they might think and do with it. Thank you, Brian, for bringing in the example from the Church of England and the, the seasonal prayers over the water. I've just recently watched on Zoom the Friends Baptism in the Church of England at Easter time. And it was interesting to, to look at how things come in different places, including the signing before the actual baptism, which interested me. Ch Charles, I really appreciate this, the, the work you've done on baptism and the chapters on it. It actually feels like such a privilege to be on this discussion with all of you and to be with the Victoria chapter of AAL and to be enjoying this book together. I notice that you say you start, the commentary attends to a range of theological, liturgical and performance details. And that's exactly what it, what it's, it does. The theology around baptism is very comprehensively um, unpacked. The liturgical stuff, I find uh, the liturgical material is enormously helpful simply in how to do it. All the, the, the long section, I think it was long, on what to do with water would be very helpful for a newly ordained person. 
how are you, you know, whether you're going to use, as we say in this country, copious quantities of water, and one hopes that you do, and how to deal with full immersion, baptism, and all of that. It's very practical. So the performance, again, we have the performance concept, but not and in this sense, much more practical, perhaps, than your overall performance that liturgical that liturgy is in, in the life of faith. You start with, with evangelism in the mission context, and that's exactly what I would expect. And I really like the from washing to drowning concept, which I've already mentioned. I particularly appreciated here the work from Ron Dowling. And again, I think, as Brian has said, it's great to see the life of, of the work that went into APBA and how the compromises were made and how the expertise of various people was brought. And I think that that insight has been very helpful. I, I appreciate the rebuttal of myths, popular myths about baptism. I did enjoy the mention of a bush christening, which I know off by heart, by Benjo Patterson, and <laughs> also the um, reference to Blinky Bill. I thought some of your footnotes throughout the book were, were amusing, and that had to take the cake as the most amusing. So the whole thing at this point is, is very useful and readable. I want the APBA right to be sharper, and its ethical requirements, perhaps more heading towards what Brian's suggesting of stages as people are ready. I wonder if in the way baptism is presented in APBA, if we're still really baptizing anyone who asks, and we'll come to that later on about who is actually asking these days. I like in the liturgy, the strength of the renunciations and Charles's unpacking of that and deeply valuing that. I've also found very helpful terms that may matter, and as I said earlier, the practical side, preparing things. I'd like to have seen more about what the church is doing in baptism. We are the baptizing community, and I just read somewhere this morning some words um, about when we worship we are living, no, I'll come back to that later because it perhaps has more relevance to another question. Uh, yeah, I will now. Every occasion of corporate worship is in fact a living out of one's baptism. So we're within the new community. We're being formed in community, living out our baptism as we worship. And neither baptism nor discipleship is principally about the life of the individual. So in baptizing, it's not, obviously not just about the baptizing priest and the individual. It's an ecclesial sacrament that reveals what the church is on about, what the church's identity and nature are, and what it means to be incorporated into the body of Christ the faithful. On page 82, there's a section called Preparing the People, which I'd love to have had a, made a bit fuller, but, so that the congregation is prepare, prepared for what it, this baptism means in their life as, as church and, and how it shapes them. So I'm glad there's a section called that, but I would like it to be more congregationally focused. And that's probably all I want to say at the moment. Thank you both. And my hope would be that the, the book, the commentary, um, emphasizes the lines you're taking. Like I tried to say what Brian has said about um, delay. Um, I'd love to see every baptism start with Thanksgiving for a child and hopefully offer Thanksgiving for a child, um, you know, for, for everybody who wants it. Um, at one point, the commentary on Thanksgiving for a child, which is towards the end of the book, um, is the chapter I'm most happy with because I think it's the chapter that takes most seriously what it is to raise children in today's Australia. Um, I had a research student once who interviewed 100 couples at East Camberwell Infant Welfare Centre. And if you know Melbourne, East Camberwell is reasonably respectable. About 
35 of the 100 had some form of Christian or Jewish um, initiation rite. About 32 or three of them had a party and 32 or three did absolutely nothing. I mean, the celebration of birth was just being lost. And for churches just to offer baptism to fill that, apart from being a Christendom appropriate context, is today just a mistake. Um, so um, Thanksgiving of a child, which is printed quite early in the book, um, but is nevertheless a pastoral service, I'd commend to everybody. And it's, I'd love to have an ecumenical baby blessing afternoon on football fields where the churches of the town do that once a quarter. I mean, anyway, so I've tried to sort of drop hints and give ideas. Um, on preparing the congregation and baptism as an ecclesial event, I utterly agree. But I know when um, my wife went to a parish which was one of Melbourne's oldest and looked lovely. If you had a baptism Sunday, at first, regulars would stay away because why do we want to put up with all these people who make noises and all the rest of it? I'm glad to say after a few months, they liked coming because it's, the service was fun um, and things happened. Um, but that sort of attention practically, I think is really, really needed today. Um, on seasonal blessings, well, it's a good suggestion for our liturgical commission to have a look at England and, you know, do some for us. Noting, of course, that Lent is in autumn here. And, um, you know, those um, seasonal things um, could be taken into account. Um, but the, the final thing I just want to say to people who haven't read the book, um, there are three chapters, the first on the theology of baptism, where I think it's really important that we rec understand older terms like validity, efficacy, ex opere operato, ex opere operatus, and the difference, because um, I think if a couple, especially if a single mum turns up for baptism, you baptise the child um, and trust the grace of God. But on the other hand, you know, putting hurdles over people um, unnecessarily, I don't like. So I, the theology of the scholastic period as taken seriously in the Reformation um, applied to today, I think really is important. Um, the next chapter is about aspects of preparing, preparing not just the candidates, but the people, the things, the place, etc., etc. And only then does it go on to an actual commentary, which if you're not an Anglican is probably boring. Um, but I think that's all I'll need to say. I just hope this pr pr prompts a little later a wider discussions about what does it mean to initiate people into Christ through the spirit in this land today. I wonder if I might just um, add two points. Mm. Is that right? Um, yes. Uh, I like your discussion of water, cold or warm. Um, and uh, you suggested that uh, warm water um, might suggest that baptism is nice when it's not nice. No. no. Um, I want to make the suggestion that at least with infant baptism, which is probably m the form that most of us are likely to have experienced, um, uh, warm is better because to encourage, in my view, because otherwise the default is sprinkling and lessening the use of water. Um, I, 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 uh, Kieran mentioned um, that I'd written on baptism in, 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 in this one. There is a, a photograph of me immersing a baby in a font. It has warm water, um, but clergy don't like to get wet. Um, but the thing is, if you don't like symbolism, you shouldn't be doing any of this anyway. Um, uh, and the um, nice anecdote I have, I'm getting old now, so I can tell anecdotes. Um, uh, St. Andrew the Great in Cambridge uh, was made redundant, but it was taken over by the Round Church, which is a very um, uh, modern evangelical um, congregation of Anglicans, uh, more in the vineyard line of uh, worship. Um, and they reordered at their own expense uh, uh, St. Andrew the Great. And they uh, asked permission to, on what they call the stage, because that's, you know, the sanctuary is now a stage, um, 
to have a sunken uh, tank for um, immersion, except they made a special request that though it wouldn't be seen by people, the tank would have a division, it would be two chambers, one with water and one without, because the minister didn't want to get wet. Oh. And we simply said in the Diocese of Ely, uh -uh, if you want to play that game, you get wet. The uh, point is, we shouldn't be afraid of the element, you know. Uh, so it may be that uh, warm should be encouraged so that we can actually dip infants without them screaming, not because baptism is nice, but because otherwise we will default to sprinkling, which minimizes the, um, the, the symbolism. And just another point from me, that Brian's words of Stark. Where in the world is the ancient baptismal font that's coffin shaped. Does anybody know? I've seen a photo of it. So dying with Christ becomes very real if you are baptized into a coffin shaped font. And I find that powerful stuff. So we need to make it crunchy, which probably means we need cold water, but maybe we need, need warm water to make it more pleasant and to get away from the risk of sprinkling and making it a brief moment when we should be really, really noting the significance of it for us all. The, the other St. John I... East Bentley, you will see a coffin-shaped font in Melbourne. Where is it? St. John's East Bentley. It's, 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 as you walk in, it's right in front of you. Um, a little later, she didn't install it, but Elizabeth Smith was the vicar there for some time, and she welcomed it. But on sprinkling, Brian, I have a bit of a, a blast against the idea of sprinkling, I much prefer to talk of pouring. The sprinkling then is left for other occasions, but mm. but I and, and and again when um, parents approach well, me and my wife for baptism, one question is well, um, particularly if they're a bit nominal. Well, the next time we meet to talk about the service, giving them some hint that there should be some preparation, you've got two options: the baby can either have water poured on them or they can be given a bath. What would you like? We want you to tell me next time. And of course, they then said, well, why is there a difference? And you get a chance to do some theology. Well, one speaks of, you know, being washed and dying with Christ and being raised. And the other one speaks of the spirit being poured into your heart. And anyway, it's enough of that. <laughs> but but I, I mean, whether the water's warm or not, yes, um, an encouragement of infants being submersed, as was the case, of course, at the Reformation, um, is to be encouraged. On the warm and cold, I have memories of my teenage parish where there was a baptism in the depths of winter and they poured hot water into a very cold marble font in the expectation that the temperature would come down to just right in the middle of the service. And the family walked past the font and gave it a very startled look when they saw the steam rising off it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was one of those uh, moments of pastoral learning, I, I think. Um, we've largely addressed the, the, the contour of the second question I had for baptism, which was around educating and re-educating presiders and people in the theology and practice of Christian initiation. Um, so it's just worth noting that, that we've acknowledged um, that uh, baptism is becoming an increasingly rare event in our churches and so change has um, means now that baptism is not so much of a social rite of passage for a newly born child. Um, if we're okay to move on to our second focus, which is Eucharist, um, I'd, I'd like to ask about Eucharistic celebrations over Zoom and perhaps combine this with a question about what's fresh and new or critical and challenging. Um, in the last 12 months, uh, certainly in the Academy chapter here, we've hosted discussions about, well, what is Eucharist if it's being done virtually through a Zoom meeting or through a recorded celebration? Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask Jenny to speak first and then Brian, and then Charles can come back. 
And the question is, in the light of Eucharistic celebrations over Zoom, what does Charles's writing offer to help us to reclaim the role of the congregation together with the presider in the Eucharistic celebration? Um, so Jenny, you first. Yeah, I guess Charles, like the rest of us, didn't think at all about Eucharists on Zoom when this was being written. It was the last thing on our minds two years ago. And we've learned a little, and we for some of us, we found what are stumbling blocks for us, theologically and practically, with trying to continue our worship in the lockdown periods. I was deeply moved by Charles's section in chapter 13 on the presence of Christ in time and eternity and the sac Christ's sacramental presence, Christ's living presence. And I triggered my, it sparked my thinking about how what we do liturgically crosses time and space and is not limited by the problems of Zoom. And that was all very nice. But in fact, we still have people wanting to celebrate communion perhaps with a wafer at home and a small cup of wine, and I still struggle with that. The other piece that was useful, I think, in this chapter was also on his, his focus on anamnesis. If we're going to have Eucharist um, by Zoom, the, the power of the anamnesis and the remembering the story becomes absolutely crucial. But I'm mindful of Gary Weatherall's words at the beginning in his forward, in his preface. No, it wasn't, it was a forward. Liturgy is more than words. Zoom makes it words. It's very hard not to be just simply words when we're doing stuff on Zoom. And no matter what we try to tell ourselves about discerning the body, it is very, very tricky. So the idea of the Episcopal diaconal dialogue is a very difficult thing to do. And I would be very interested to hear um, from others about how that they've, they've worked that out in, in these times. I'm rather stumped by it myself. Uh, I think that um, the experience of um, Zoom services and COVID has uh, caught us all um, on the hop uh, without ready-made answers. Um, the churches I serve, um, the um, priest who was in charge, we had a, 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 in real time Eucharist and people were encouraged to take uh, bread and wine in their home. Uh, that seemed to me to be okay, particularly um, uh, with the reading uh, of uh, First Sunday after Easter and uh, that the, um, the, the, the closed doors did not keep the risen Christ out. Yeah. And I don't think um, this does. The problem is that um, because I'm not um, a member of the Episcopal Church, um, I don't get all the memos. And in fact, this uh, way of um, celebrating had already been outlawed uh, by the bishops. So the Bishop of Connecticut um, kindly drew my attention to this and um, we now have to do what he calls a spiritual communion. And basically it's because the rubrics didn't allow for it. Well, um, you know, when the rubrics were framed, no one thought of, 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 of this. I suppose my only insight and thought is that I think my experience is there's a difference between recording and in real time Zoom. Um, in real time Zoom, I would think that um, that in some way still embodies the church. That's very different from somebody, let's say, recording somebody as a priest saying the words institution and then each time they wanted a communion, just pressing the button and having it replayed every time. I think there's a difference between in real time and, and something that's recorded. Um, and my experience of that was a service that um, 
I did many years ago in Mark I Chapel at Yale, which was a, a blended Eucharist uh, using uh, things from the Eastern um, uh, Syrian Orthodox, Maronite, as well as Western Rite. And um, I was a celebrant. My wife, who is a UCC minister, was a co-celebrant. And uh, a visiting um, ethnomusicologist, a Maronite priest, concelebrated, and we all, all, wear, all wore Syrian Orthodox vestments. Now, usually I am very nervous because all the students are looking for the professor of liturgy to do something stupid, uh, which he usually does. But um, uh, once we, that service, when we went into it, I lost all track of time. And at the end, I said, oh my God, that ended quickly. My wife said, yes, has it ended? And the Maronite priest said, yes, has it ended? Um, now, it was recorded. We've played the recording again. And the thing that's missing is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present in the community at the time. It is not in the recording. <laughs> So uh, that's where I get my analogy that in real time, I'm sure that there can be a presence, but that's just my view uh, as opposed to a recording. Uh, it's a, a brief response because the chapters had some excellent papers by Robert Gribben and discussion on this. Um, but if my book contributed anything, it would be to say, stop trying it, just have decent services of the word or anti-communion. Um, I've tried to um, get across to, I mean, let me start again. I think all Christians would feel that personally, the climax of the service is receiving communion. But ecclesially, that's got to be balanced by the offering of praise and thanksgiving. And, you know, there's theological issues about what that offering might mean. And I just struggle to see how on Zoom, you can have a, a corporate offering of thanksgiving, let alone the problems of receiving communion um, at a distance. So my book would be basically reinforcing a fairly no case, but we've already discussed that. Um, can I say one thing? Um, I mean, after a couple of weeks, I just stopped watching, I'm sorry, particularly because I found it increasingly offensive to see the priest receive the bread and the wine, knowing that pretty much no one else could. Uh, one priest who was happens to be a reasonably close relative, but not the wife, went a halfway house by not doing them, but offering them in, in with words that adapted the words of administration, so that there was a sense of corporate spiritual communion, which was, a, you know, a, starting to be a sensible adaptation but this chapter has discussed this a lot so i hope that the book tries to give more evangelical anglicans an appreciation for the offering dimension and i hope it gives more catholic anglicans an indication of some of the very sensitive issues around words of administration and um, and stuff like that thank you charles and brian and jenny um, a broader question, and and this is this is one that um, perhaps allows you to um, share more broadly anything that that you um, have in mind that that hasn't already come into the conversation. Uh, but with the Eucharistic discussion in in Charles's book. Uh, what lines does it suggest for ways to educate and re-educate both presiders and people more broadly in the theology and practice of Eucharist? And I, I noticed that Charles has already brought up the question of, of words of administration, uh, but I wonder if there's perhaps a little bit more to, to highlight in, in this direction. So uh, we'll have Jenny first, then Brian. I found the question of education, one that came to my mind frequently as I read and reread Australian Anglicans worship performing APBA, partly because 
Chow sparked my interest with his good questions about page 40 something, I think that, oh no, sorry. Sorry, let me just check the book again. Very early on, he, he gave us some questions to discuss. It was about around page 40 something. And I thought, now I'm expecting that later on, that there'll be questions to reflect on as we go through. It didn't come up as much as I thought. And then I realized there were times when Charles was telling us things that I thought vaguely could be a wee bit school teachery. And I hope that's not too critical. One of them was about the fraction. And there was a thing about transference that stayed in my mind. But I could have done with some more questions, some more exercises, I think he called them, through the book to take, perhaps to feed into sermons. I was brought up in my curacy that you preach frequently on the Eucharist and what we're doing in Eucharist. And I, I haven't forgotten that, even though I don't do it often enough now. And that is certainly one way of teaching people about what's going on. As is, I guess, where, however it is that we introduce children to communion. I, I'm picking that the Australian practice is mixed about children receiving communion from baptism and that maybe they are formally received into communion when they're seven or something like that. That's an opportunity to do teaching for everybody in the congregation, not just for the children. And it seems to me that we need to make a lot more of those, those chances. So preaching regularly and both presiders and people need to know these things because I see some very strange things going on in presiding. One of them that I see, I'm one of five other priests in this parish besides the vicar. And one of my colleagues does no manual actions at all, which I find deeply distressing. But I noticed Charles's comment that, um, that the, the APBA does not say anything about manual acts, probably because the commission could not agree. I'm not sure. So we, there's, there's work to be done for us all as we hold together the breadth of Anglicanism and as we allow people to do their, what reflects their own theology of Eucharist. But there are some bottom lines, I think. That's me. I think that any teaching that uh, can be given to clergy uh, explaining the history of the Eucharist, its shape, uh, its meaning, and how to preside in a dignified and decent way is uh, extremely important. So that's one of the great pluses in what uh, Charles has been doing. I suppose I have some questions and perhaps the opposite of Jenny. Um, uh, as I read the uh, older uh, uh, IALC um, studies, it was uh, suggested that uh, any um, uh, gestures during the Eucharistic prayer um, should be questioned because it suggested that some part of it was somewhat more holy or important than any other. Um, so uh, I have to say that um, my, my students uh, at, uh, at, at Yale, the, the Episcopal students have always thought that I'm um, I think a Zwinglian, um, uh, because uh, I don't uh, do manual acts, uh, but I tell them I was brought up not to play with my food, and so there we are. Um, uh, so uh, nothing is touched until till the fraction. Um, and uh, I think I become more entrenched in that because I see the, a, a number of Episcopal uh, clergy. I mean, the, the words of institution, they will take up the bread, they will turn around, lift it up in the air, and, you know, I think of a, uh, a, a get, getting the actor of the year award or something. Um, I don't think in the end congregations are really interested in what antics and gestures people are doing unless it directly affects them. And most, I think, in the Eucharistic prayer trying to pray and concentrate, not watching what the person behind the table is bobbing up and down doing or not. Um, 
I think that uh, it was some good debunking, particularly about um, uh, why uh, water is added to the wine. Um, yep, because it was syrupy <laughs> in Mediterranean culture and uh, we just continue it. Uh, and it gets rid of all this um, highfalutin theological stuff that's read into it, which is uh, total nonsense. Um, <clears throat> I suppose I wanted to ask though, is um, Charles about the, um, and I may be getting way off the question here, so I apologies. Um, in scripture, inanimate things are not blessed, but God is blessed. Um, I, I wonder though, isn't, isn't the epiclesis, certainly in um, the classical Eucharistic prayers, made over an inanimate element to ask them to become animate and life-giving? And um, uh, I just raised the question, is that legitimate? Um, because that's what most of the Eastern and Afras are, are actually asking. Um, I think I want to leave it there. Just a quick response. Jenny, yes, the idea of further questions for the book would have been a good one and it didn't, didn't occur to me at the time, I'm sorry. Um, but in the earlier book, there are questions on each chapter. Um, and, and I suppose too, particularly on the Eucharist, when you get into the minutiae of small things that can blow up to be, you know, large theological issues or show a lack of awareness, perhaps, yeah, forming questions could be taking too much of a side. I don't, I don't, I don't know. On why there's no rubrics for manual acts, Brian's point is simply the one, all the commission believed IALC. Um, but in, in practice, um, there was a variety but nobody on the commission in the services we took would do more than take up the bread and take up the wine at the appropriate points. Um, it's my practice, however, um, to leave that until the point where we get to an explicit anamnesis in each of the five things, and then to take up the bread and wine to say, we're doing something with this material stuff, folks, um, which some evangelicals, suddenly realize is the proper side of the, the Catholic emphasis upon offering. Um, you know, and anyway, um, in terms of um, the, the blessing thing, well, all I can say, Brian, is that the commission believed that the Eastern tradition moving from epiclesis to blessing was one step too far. And um, there is quite a discussion of ep epiclesis because that is a debated issue and especially in the second thanksgiving which is the most australian um you know th there's a deliberate calling of the spirit send forth your blessing um, um on primarily the people of who are about to receive this bread and wine so the blessing of bread and wine directly I believe, and the Commission believes, um, is moving beyond the scriptural sense that you bless God for things. And I've got an article on that in a recent AJL that people can have a look at. Uh, but, but thank you for those comments. I mean, I just hope that people might enjoy some of the detailed discussion of there are theological issues behind things like why does the presiding minister receive first, which I've heard objected to as democratic. And the answer is, if you don't want, if you want to dispense grace without having received it, forget it. You know, there's a whole lot of things that, you know, un forces to, to reflect upon the whys and the hows in performance that partly support, partly contest our so-called democratic or participatory culture. Um, and that's been of more concern to me in many ways than some of the traditional fights, although I've tried to offer ways forward and behind those traditional fights that I hope speak to more than Anglicans. And again, as with the baptism chapter, those of you who aren't Anglicans, I hope would find the two or three chapters, two on theology, one on practice, helpful, and you know, forget the commentary one, if you like. And finally, I should say, I, I can't help but, um, you know, I grew up in the Book of Common Prayer and 
started thinking about theology when I would write notes on the server's notice board at age of 11 or 12, objecting to what some people were doing because I started to read the rubrics. But on the other hand, 26 years on Arctic led me to appreciate at a more gut level what is important and going on in the Roman Catholic and wider Western tradition than just you know, a narrowly Cranmerian one. And I hope both those things are spoken to in the book. I, I suppose I'm, I'm left with one question that <clears throat> I, I certainly don't have an answer to, but what is it in the end that makes a, a, Eucharistic, a, a Eucharistic service an Anglican one? Um, I think that the irony of um, divine worship of the ordinariate, which is stuff full of Cranmer, Mm. And, and those certainly um, Church of England clergy who left to join the Ordinariate will now be praying more of Cranmer than they ever did when they were in the Church of England. Mm. Mm. But what, what in the end makes it uh, an, a, a, a Eucharistic liturgy an Anglican one? Um, I'm not expecting anyone to answer because I'm not sure there is one other oh. than if it's authorised by an Anglican province. Yeah, I can certainly say there's no such thing as an Anglican baptism. <laughs> on that affirming note which we can at least ecumenically <laughs> agree on uh, we have a few minutes for two or three um, questions comments or reflections from our wider meeting attendance um, could i ask you if you wish to speak to um, make sure that you raise your hand or use the chat function to alert me that you wish to speak so that I can call on you. And of course, when you are called on, please remember to unmute. Um, I've noticed in the chat dialogue as, as our discussion has unfolded that we've had some very pointed remarks from Alison Wish, Robert Gribben and Gareth Gilbert Hughes. So I was wondering if any of you three might be interested in offering something first. If you're inviting me, yes, I, am. <laughs> I, won't com I, 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 I won't comment on the many interesting and fascinating issues that have come up in, in this intra-Anglican discussion, which has been illuminating, uh, probing, uh, and, and, and deeply encouraging, uh, all based on the gift of Charles's book, uh, which I have literally read cover to cover uh, and worn out at least one soft lead pencil on uh, so that I can find the bits that I want. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the fact that we are an ecumenical academy. Um, we owe a great debt to the number of our members increasing over the years, I'm glad to say, who've also benefited from membership of the Societas Liturgica, um, but also on ecumenical theology and practice as it is published. Uh, some of us are old enough, Darcy, <laughs> to have begun when there was virtually nothing, uh, particularly on Reformed or Methodist uh, uh, liturgical practice or, as Charles always insists, theology. Um, um, the Uniting Church at the moment has, has, has paused, at least I don't actually think it's a decision, it, ha it has not added to our book which is now something like 16 years old. Um, I noticed uh, Brian's comment in passing that he wondered whether there were to be any further uh, prayer books and I'd be interested in these reply. <clears throat> um, but mostly I just want to express my, my gratitude for the ecumenical conversation because uh, in some ways the most important thing to have happened in the lifetime of some of us was the Second Vatican Council and the liturgical uh, text that came out of that which then opened up um, liturgical theology and practice for, for the Roman tradition from which we all learned. We don't have to agree with particular parts of the theology, but Rome has, we all owe Rome a huge debt for this. And the irony, of course, is that um, actually APBA and its predecessor were all discussed in the Australian consultation on liturgy as it was being 
uh, prepared. So it had the comments of Catholic, in at least for a time, Orthodox, um, Lutheran, Presbyterian, um, uh, and Uniting Church as, as the very words were put down and vice versa. So hallelujah for the movement of the spirit. Uh, and where is the ecumenical movement, our dear partner now? Thanks again to Charles. Thank you, Robert. Um, ecumenism is such an important part of, of what we do. Um, some people may have noticed in the chat dialogue that Margie Dahl has um, offered us a reflection that her return to faith came through having her children baptised and that she may not have been so receptive to a thanksgiving uh, that this might have been perceived as lesser. Could I just ask very much in, in the spirit of a quick fire question to our panel, in light of a reflection like that, what, what would our, our ideal response be um, if we were placing baptism and, might I say, confirmation, which hasn't come into our discussion, um, in a in a more robust catechumenal framework is is this kind of the the fountain of youth or is there something more to be said um so brian and charles and jenny if if you want to if you have something to say i'd be very happy i just want to clarify that <clears throat> what i was suggesting was that if you have state rights it isn't a question of a thanksgiving and not baptism mm. it's that everybody starts off first with a thanksgiving mm. then move on to baptism <clears throat> so it's not <clears throat> saying um i'm sorry you 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 can't have the wonderful dinner we're just going to give you some crumbs from the table mm. it's that everybody does this and, and i would agree with that and, and i think maggie's comment warms my heart. I just think if people approach the baptism, you offer them baptism, but it's the style. If you say, well, do we want to regard this as an inconvenient thing? Do we want to regard this as some half-baked thing by people who really don't have any faith? Or do we want to say, we want to roll the red carpet out for you for what the Christian faith offers in its fullness? And that can start with Thanksgiving for a child and take the baptismal dimension seriously, make sure the service is well conducted, that people are there to welcome them, you know, roll the red carpet out and we get Margie's. I really appreciated Charles's suggestions for the use of Thanksgiving for a child. It's very flexible. There's lots of possibilities. I know when ours came out in a New Zealand prayer book in 1989 and been, had been used before that, women were still staying in a maternity hospital for several days and it was quite a practice for the local vicar to use that service with the woman or and her, maybe her partner and the child in that situation or when they've got just got home it's really important i think that it's not offered as something lesser and maggie's comment here is quite is a good challenge and I'm picking up some, in my thoughts something Brian said about Indigenous people's involvement in the liturgical life of the Australian Anglican Church, about which I know absolutely nothing. But I remember offering baptism and thanksgiving to a Pākehā white New Zealand couple and to a Māori family at the same time, several years, some years ago. The Maori family would not touch Thanksgiving. They had to have baptism because baptism is what matters to us as Maori. That may be true of indigenous people more widely. I don't know. But it's something I've been very conscious of that I don't want to say you can have that one or that one. They, they are part of a, a stages thing, as Brian was saying. And, and I would like to use Thanksgiving much more and maybe some people don't go on to the baptism stage. But if there's to be more education about and more formation before baptism happens, the formation is not only with the candidate and family. It continues to need to be done with the congregation. 
Thanksgiving is a right of birth, which our society needs. Baptism is a right of new birth. And that, that comment reminds me too, in doing funerals, which we haven't talked about, um, the service, Walter, resources funeral for an infant who has died near the time of birth um, was one of the hardest things the draft I've ever done because you knew it would never be used um, lightly. But an important difference there was the experience of the mother who had had the child in the womb for nine months and the experience of the father um, for whom this was friendly but external were quite different. Um, so that's the only time we've talked about gender, but we've tried to take gender issues very seriously through APBA and I hope in this book. Thank you. Um, we could almost devote a meeting to each section of this, this wonderful book. Um, it's, it's such a rich um, commentary on, on, a, on a prayer book that has really shaped Anglican worship for 25, 26 years. We've come to the end of our meeting time. And so I, let me encourage you to continue thinking and to, um, to carry on reflecting on the, on the um, discussion we've had. Uh, as we end, I just want to draw attention to some comings and goings to let you know about our next meeting and then to wind off with a prayer from APBA that was written by an Indigenous elder, and that's a thanksgiving for Australia. And with that, we will draw our proceedings for today to a close. So among our comings and goings, I'm delighted to welcome a new member who I'm, I, I'm afraid isn't with us today, but uh, is in spirit, I hope. Uh, and that new member is Chris McElhinney. Chris brings a breadth of study and experience in music and theology and liturgical studies, and he, he has an absolutely amazing breadth of, of experience as a musician and as someone studying in institutions as diverse as the Sydney Conservatorium, Australian Catholic University and the University of Divinity. And so it's great to welcome you, Chris. I hope you may see this. One of our distinguished long-standing members, Father Christopher Wilcock, was recently awarded an honorary doctorate by Australian Catholic University in recognition of his contribution to liturgical music. Uh, I will link in our member email to his address on that occasion, which is quite a, a beautiful reflection on how music and liturgy and, and, for, and for Chris, how priesthood connects all of this together. Uh, another of our members, Fiona Dybel, has recently taken up a new role as Liturgy and Formation Officer in the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference Office for Social Justice. So congratulations to Fiona. Um, and also I myself am about to mark a, a bit of a milestone. Um, I will be commencing duties very soon as the new Director of Music in the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in Wangaratta. I see also Alison Wish is sharing that um, sharing a reflection on Thanksgiving for her daughter. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday the 14th of July and our speaker will be Peter Grayson Weeks. Peter is uniquely positioned to address the topic for this meeting having been involved in the process of liturgical renewal and liturgical adaptation, himself a celebrant of this rite and as someone who has helped other people celebrate it. And the rite to which I refer is the development of the Uniting Church's marriage service for same-sex couples. Um, the meeting page for this, this meeting will be available very soon. Um, please keep an eye out and it, it will pop up in the next week or so. I strongly encourage you to book. Uh, this too will be on Zoom and uh, it, will be, it will be a very rich discussion about um, how the Uniting Church has responded to the advent of marriage equality in Australia and I think a very important topic 
that we're able to take up. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and especially our panel, Brian, Jenny and Charles. It's been a, a really wonderful discussion. As we wind up, let us pray together a thanksgiving for Australia. God of holy dreaming, great creator spirit, from the dawn of creation, you have given your children the good things of Mother Earth. You spoke and the gum tree grew. In the vast desert and dense forest, and in cities at the water's edge, creation sings your praise. Your presence endures as the rock at the heart of our land. When Jesus hung on the tree, you heard the cries of all your people and became one with your wounded ones, the convicts, the hunted, and the dispossessed. The sunrise of your sun coloured the earth anew and bathed it in glorious hope. In Jesus we have been reconciled to you, to each other, and to your whole creation. Lead us on, Great Spirit, as we gather from the four corners of the earth. Enable us to walk together in trust from the hurt and shame of the past into the full day which is dawned in Jesus Christ. Amen.